to understand right in the beginning that the methodology of hip joint examination as it is taught con conventionally is based on the premise that we are dealing with a unilateral hip involvement because it is heavily dependent on comparison with the contralateral normal side. Needless to say, you need adequate exposure to embark upon hip joint examination. And what do we mean by adequate exposure? As far as the male patient is concerned, one needs to have the patient in a Frenchy type of underwear and insofar as a female patient is concerned, she should be in underwear and braziers. She should also be examined only in the presence of a female staff nurse or a female relative. Well, as far as the examination is concerned, I would advise the postgraduate students to carry one new Frenchy type of underwear when they are going for the final examination because most of the examinations are held in public hospitals and the patients presenting there are the poorest of the poor and they may not be having a decent underwear available. So it would be a good incentive that you are offering to the patient in the form of a new Frenchy underwear. He is going to cooperate with you much better and when you are presenting the patient it would appear to be uh, the patient will be neatly dressed. Today, it is not only important that the product should be good, but it is equally important that the packaging of the product should also be attractive. Well, what I am trying to tell you is nothing new, but I am going to suggest to you that you examine the patient in a sequence and the first part of the sequence happens to be the gait of the patient. You must have come across recommendations that the gait should be examined at the end of the examination. Well, I leave it to you, whatever sequence you want to follow, it is up to you. But the point in favor of examining the gait is the fact that imagine yourself sitting in the OPD and a patient walks up to you. The first thing which you notice in this patient who happens to be a hip joint pathology case is the gait of the patient. The way he walks towards you is the first observation which the physician or orthopedic surgeon makes about the patient. Well, insofar as the gait is concerned, in a hip joint case, there are three pure varieties of gaits, the antalgic, the short limb and the Trendelenburg gait. Uh, well, in any given case, there may be a comb combination or a superimposition of one pattern over the other because to give you an example, if the hip joint is destroyed due to a tubercular infection, the same patient would be having a short limb as well as an antalgic gait. So one needs to decipher the various components of the gait. One also needs to remember that in the presence of shortening, the Trendelenburg component may get masked or may become less obvious. While observing the gait of a patient, it is important that the patient should be observed first while walking towards the orthopedic surgeon and thereafter going away from the orthopedic surgeon. He should be made to walk at least 15 to 20 steps 
to make a correct assessment of the gait. There is no harm in making him walk to and fro two or three times before you make a final impression about the gait of the patient. In this particular patient that we are demonstrating, uh, we need to see what is the gait pattern. So, in case the, this is the patient walking towards the orthopedic surgeon and what we find is that he is walking with an equinus probably compensating for a short limb and if you look at the right flank of the patient, the flank is uh, When he is going away from you, look at the right flank of the patient. It is, a furrow is appearing there and this means that there is a Tendenberg component. As far as the Tendenberg component is concerned, it involves swaying of the pelvis away from the midline. A short limb component of the gait involves sagging of the trunk and the shoulder, whereas a Tendenberg gait would involve midline shift, swaying of the trunk away from the midline. Thereafter, the patient is to be examined in the standing position, first from the front, then from the side, and then with the candidate standing behind the patient. In assessment from the front, one needs to delineate what is the level of the anterior superior iliac spine in comparison to the normal side on the affected side. From the side, it is easy to comment upon whether there is an exaggerated lumbar lordosis. From behind, one can comment upon the coronal plane deformity of the spine which happens to be scoliosis and last but not the least, the Tendenberg sign can also be tested only in the standing position. Well, to give you a better idea of what all is to be examined in the standing position, one needs to know that majority of the examination of a hip joint pathology is performed with the patient in the supine position lying down. So only those things which are liable to change in the standing position are to be commented upon. So it is easy to remember that a level of anterior superior alic spine which may be which may be affected by shortening of the lower limb will become corrected when the patient lies supine. On the other hand, parameters like wasting of the thigh muscles is not going to change whether the patient is in the standing position or in the lying down position. So it should be commented only in the lying down position. So with the patient in standing position, if you observe the patient from the front, he is standing with an equinus deformity at the ankle or equinus attitude. The knee on the affected side is flexed more than the normal knee. Observing the patient from the side, one can again see that the lumbar lordosis is exaggerated and the affected side knee is more flexed than the normal knee. So there is an intricate play between the equinus at the ankle and the flexion at the knee joint to compensate for the shortening which seems to be fully compensated because when you look at the spine from behind, the spine 
has no coronal plane deformity. There is no scoliosis. So the limb length discrepancy seems to be adequately compensated by the two mechanisms which have been mentioned. While commenting on the anterior superior iliac spine, one needs to realize that your eye level should be in the same, almost same horizontal plane as the pelvis. So the examiner or the candidate is advised to kneel down in the squatting position or in the squatting position and observe the anterior superior alex spine by putting the thumbs in juxtaposition to the anterior spine superior alex spine on both the sides similarly while performing the trendenberg sign wherein the gluteal folds are the landmark or the indicators to be observed as far as the classical Trendenburg sign is concerned, the candidate needs to kneel down or be in the squatting position so that the eye level is almost at the level of the gluteal fold. Well, the three stages in which the Trendenburg sign is to be tested are make the patient stand first on the unaffected side and you will observe that the gluteal fold on the normal on the affected side rises up this is followed by a phase of double stance and finally the patient is made to stand on the affected limb which is the right limb on this side and you will observe that the gluteal fold has sagged in this particular patient, which means that the Trenenberg sign is positive. Well, this is a video demonstration of the same patient. Standing first on the normal side, the affected side gluteal fold rising up, double stance phase followed by standing on the affected side and there is a sag of the gluteal fold signifying or suggesting a positive Trendelenburg sign.